uh, I'm going to introduce actually the, my next speaker, Dr. Shah. He's going to talk about MRI. Dr. Shah is our uh, interim director of the Imaging Institute, and uh, he's the director of a cardiovascular MRI. Uh, again, Deepan has really uh, developed our cardiac MRI program into the largest program in the country and, uh, and doing a lot of exciting research. Uh, Deepan? Thank you, Suman. All right, so um, let me uh, get started. So how many of you uh, at your institution, how many of you have cardiac MRI capabilities? So about half, and how many of you do not? Okay. So there's a lot of people that, that, that didn't say anything. They were quiet. So I, I wanna make sure I keep you all awake here. So I'm gonna go through a lot in 15 minutes here, um, but the basic idea is I wanna try to show you what cardiac MRI can be used for, all right? The objective of this talk is not to teach you how to read cardiac MRI scans, but rather just to get an overview of when, when it can be helpful. So next slide, please. So first thing I think we need to keep in mind is what is it that we're using? So, um, you know, in the most basic sense, what we're really dealing with is a magnetic field uh, and radio waves that we're transmitting uh, back and forth. So was it? Okay. So, um, and you can do uh, MR imaging with a variety of different uh, elements. You could do it, we could do spectroscopy with carbon, with uh, sodium, but the reason that, that most MRI that's done clinically uh, is with hydrogen or protons, as we call it, is because, in fact, two-thirds of the body is composed of water. Uh, and so, therefore, it gives you a very high signal when we use uh, hydrogen-based imaging. So next slide. Okay, so first thing, this is rule number one, rule number two, rule number three, which is that the, you know, the scanner is a very powerful magnetic field, and that magnet is always on. So the lights can be out, it can be the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, that magnet is always on, and you need to keep that in mind so you do not walk into the, the MRI room, even if the patient is coding, you don't go into the room to save the patient, you have to bring the patient out of the room. And the reason for that is because this is what can happen. If somebody uh, isn't careful, and if you take metallic objects into the room, this strong magnetic field actually pulls the object, and as it gets closer, the, the, the strength of the magne magnetic field gets stronger and stronger to the point where it becomes a projectile, and there's been cases uh, of deaths that have been reported where somebody went in to take an oxygen tank into the room to try to help a patient who was having shortness of breath. So, um, you know, if you, when you go back to your institution, you can look at the ACC appropriate use criteria. These are now about 10 years old, but they give you an idea of what appropriate indications are for cardiac MRI. And I'm gonna try to go through and just kind of highlight some of the key areas. Um, but in fact, this is kind of a nice collage of the different uh, applications that CMR can be used for. And really, it, it really covers kind of a wide gambit from looking at anomalous coronaries, cardiac tumors, to uh, doing stress perfusion imaging, valve assessment, uh, pericardial disease, and, and obviously uh, assessment for cardiomyopathies and myocardial viability. So, uh, and if we look at the timeline, to give you an idea kind of historically, you know, MRI technology had really been around since the 1970s and, and really the 1980s. There were clinical MRI scanners that were out in practice but used for brain imaging or knee imaging or, or orthopedic. Uh, and the reason that they weren't used for cardiac is that with, for cardiac MRI, you have two areas uh, that you need to overcome. One is respiratory motion. You know, none of us can hold our breath forever, and therefore there's gonna be movement that's gonna occur every time we breathe. And then secondly, and more importantly, is cardiac motion, which is happening you know, on the order of every few milliseconds. Um, and so really it's, it's in the last, you know, 15 or years or so that the techniques have evolved, uh, and a lot of it's due to just improvements in computer and hardware that we can do now very fast imaging such that we can acquire these images within the duration of a five to six second breath hold. And you know the first technique, and really kind of the basic, the foundational technique that we use for all of cardiology is simply assessment of LV and RV function. And this is an example of 
use of a CMR technique uh, to assess contractile function. And you can see here that there's really no parts of the heart that we can't visualize. Uh, so you have really optimal visualization of the myocardium, uh, visualization for cardiac chamber sizes. And you'll notice, in fact, also the right ventricle is very clearly seen as well. And each of these images can be obtained within about a five-second breath hold. Um, so you really have the ability to get very high spatial and temporal resolution imaging uh, within a very short duration of time. And in fact, the other advantage of CMR is that we can pick the exact imaging planes that we want. We're not limited by acoustic windows or body habitus or ribs or anything like that. Um, and in fact, what we'll do is we'll pick uh, a series of short axis slices from the base of the heart, which is shown in the upper left, to the very apex of the heart, and these are typically done every 10 millimeters apart. So you have kind of complete coverage of the entire myocardium, and then we'll typically do the standard long axis views, the two chamber, three chamber, and four chamber views. Uh, and this entire study can be done in about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, doesn't require the need for an IV, uh, doesn't require the need for any contrast agent. And then to assess beyond just simply qualitative assessment of function, we can actually quantitate ventricular volumes and function uh, by tracing or planimetering the endocardial and uh, uh, epicardial borders, and then doing that both in diastole as well as, as in systole to derive and summating these to get end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, to get stroke volume, as well as uh, LV ejection fraction. And you'll notice in the, the right-hand side graph, it shows that there's a very tight correlation between volumes derived by CMR and volumes that were derived by cast of cadaveric heart, suggesting, in fact, that by, by use of this technique where we're making no geometric assumptions at all, uh, we can get a very accurate assessment of both volumes as well as ejection fraction and mass. And then the same principle can be applied to the right ventricle, which I showed you we can visualize very clearly as well, to be able to compute right ventricular volumes, RV stroke volumes, as well as RV uh, ejection fraction. And the appropriate, news, appropriate use criteria call this out as, as a very highly appropriate indication, which is a simply assessment of LV and RV function in patients with congenital heart disease, patients with valvular heart disease, or in patients with uh, a prior MI or heart failure, where an accurate quantitative assessment of ejection fraction is important. And then in addition to that, in patients who have discordant information or have suboptimal echocardiographic images, that's also an indication to proceed on to CMR simply for assessment of LV uh, volumes and function. Uh, the next application of CMR, I think, is what we call phase contrast. And this basically is uh, similar to your echo Doppler technique. And uh, this is a, a methodology by which we actually can encode for velocity within any given pixel. And if you draw an ROI and summate that throughout the entire cardiac cycle, you can then actually derive the volume of flow that's coming across any specific location. In this case, I'm showing you here the volume of flow coming across the ascending aorta. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side um, uh, graph here, you can see this is the systolic uh, forward flow, and then this is the absence of flow during diastole. Uh, and, and then the uh, scanner or the computer uh, uh, console can actually integrate the area underneath this curve and from this actually derive for us a total uh, volume of flow that's occurring across this blood vessel. And this can be done for any blood vessel of interest, whether it's the ascending aorta, the pulmonary artery. We could do this for the descending aorta, really any blood vessel that you're interested in looking at. Um, in addition to that, in patients who have valve disease, we could actually utilize this technique by placing a imaging volume above the aortic valve to actually then determine what's the forward flow coming across this aortic valve. And then in addition to that, determine the column of blood that's coming backward that's being pulled back by this aortic regurgitation. And then we're able to essentially quantitate the magnitude of aortic regurgitation that occurs with each cardiac cycle. So in this case, we could see that there's 50 cc's of reverse flow and 150 cc's of forward flow across this aortic valve giving us an aortic regurgitation fraction of 33%. Um, for mitral regurgitation, we use a, uh, what we call an indirect method, where we actually compute the left ventricular stroke volume by planimetry of the end diastolic and end systolic volume of all slices of the ventricle, compare that to the phase contrast derived flow across the aortic valve, and then we know that the difference between these two, the total volume of blood that's ejected from the LV minus the amount that's going forward across the aortic valve is going to be the amount of blood that's going backward 
uh, and that's your mitral regurgitation. Uh, this methodology can also be used now in congenital heart disease patients where we're trying to determine the magnitude of the shunt between the uh, between one uh, uh, cardiac, you know, between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, uh, whether it's at the aortic level, um, you can use this to compute uh, aortic and pulmonic flow fractions. Um, and so really, again, appropriate use criteria talk about uh, a very highly indicated uh, uh, reason for use of CMR when it comes to assessment of QPQS, as well as assessment of native or prosthetic uh, cardiac valves, where you're trying to determine the severity of regurgitation or stenosis and your echocardiography is suboptimal. Um, another application of CMR, which came out in the late 1990s, early 2000s, is the ability to do scar imaging by CMR. Uh, and this is done with the administration of gadolinium contrast agents. And you can see on the right-hand side here, we can see an area of what we call hyper-enhancement, which represents uh, uh, the absence of living myocytes in this area. This occurs both in the setting of an acute infarct, where you have myocyte necrosis, uh, or in the setting of a chronic infarct where you have collagen replacement fibrosis. Um, and, and in all those cases, you get uh, hyper-enhancement, uh, which, which corresponds to, again, uh, myocyte injury. And this is just an animal model showing you, in fact, that when the LED is ligated, what you see on the left-hand side as uh, infarct by TTC staining on histopathology corresponds to what you see as hyper-enhancement on our CMR scan. Uh, and in fact, what's I think most striking is that it actually gives you almost an exact match. So what you're able to see histologically, you can get the exact match of that pattern of injury uh, by use of CMR. The obvious advantage here is that the CMR can be done in a living human being. The hist histopathology can only be done at the time of autopsy after a patient's expired. Uh, and in the animal models, there's a very tight correlation between the, the size of the hyperenhancement and the size of the infarct based on histopathology. The way that this uh, imaging is done uh, doesn't require the need for stress agents, really just requires a peripheral IV to give IV ga gadolinium contrast, and then we're able to perform imaging. Uh, and in humans, this is what it looks like. Here's a patient who had an LED infarct in the past. Here's somebody who had a circumflex infarct, and you see hyperenhancement here in the left circumflex distribution. Or another patient here who had evidence of an infarction along the inferior wall uh, corresponding to right coronary artery distribution. Um, and in fact, if we use this data to try to identify those patients that are most likely to improve after revascularization, we can see that, that if there's no hyperenhancement within the wall, there's, meaning no infarct, there's a very high likelihood of improvement in contractile function versus if there's more than 75% enhancement of any given segment, then essentially no likelihood of improvement in contractile function. And interestingly, this applies not only in the setting of chronic coronary disease where you're looking at revascularization, but also in the setting of acute coronary disease where you're really looking more at stunned myocardium or in the setting of chronic heart failure in patients that are just getting treated with medical therapy, again, the same relationship that as you have more uh, scar or infarction uh, within a segment, the less likelihood there is for improvement. Now, obviously, medical therapy is not as robust as revascularization therapy is, and, and that's not a surprise either. Um, but even outside of the ischemic cardiomyopathies, in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, CMR can help us to identify a dilated versus a restrictive non-ischemic cardiomyopathy just simply based on uh, morphology and chamber sizes, um, but, but also strikingly based on the pattern of hyperenhancement that you see. Now, if you look in this patient here, you've got a thick wall. This person has a mild LV uh, dysfunction, but when we look at our delayed enhancement MRI, you see, in fact, there's hyperenhancement everywhere, not just within the left ventricle. In fact, you see it in the RV, you see it in the atri atrial wall as well, and this is a very classic finding that you see with infiltrative cardiomyopathy such as amyloid heart disease. Uh, also for RV dysplasia, we can see CMR is, is excellent for visualizing uh, abnormalities in the right ventricle, which can be used to make the diagnosis or at least provide a major imaging criteria for RV dysplasia. And in fact, this is a nice little schematic that we put together showing the differing patterns of enhancement that you see with differing forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So again, CMR takes you beyond simply identifying the presence of injury, but actually the ability to look at the pattern of injury to identify uh, a potential underlying uh, etiology. And then I think more traditional applications for CMR, such as cardiac masses, um, 
pericardial disease, where we're looking to see if there's a thickening of the pericardium uh, consistent with constriction. But I think more interestingly also is the ability of contrast-enhanced MRI to not only help us identify that there's a thickened pericardium, as we can see here just on the CINE images, but when we give contrast, we see that there's intense hyper-enhancement of the pericardial space, indicating, in fact, that there is a significant inflammatory component. And uh, this helps us to identify a phenomenon called transient constriction, where the constriction can actually go away. And it, as you can see, this patient on the top here, after about three months of aggressive anti-inflammatory therapy, you'll notice that the thickness of the pericardium has completely resolved, has normalized. Uh, and in fact, the diastolic septal bounce that you saw before seems to have gone as well. And clinically, this person had a significant improvement in symptoms just simply with medical therapy alone. And then lastly, we also use these techniques for imaging of the vascular system, uh, such as the abdominal aorta, such as the thoracic aorta, or even a full lower extremity runoff. So this, again, is just kind of a high-level overview of the variety of different applications that CMR can be used for. Uh, and I think many of us like to think of this as really a one-stop shop where it, with one uh, machine, we can really assess all disease processes that we see uh, as, as cardiovascular specialists. Uh, and again, I would encourage you to go to the appropriate use criteria that were published from the ACC uh, last decade, which uh, go through and highlight some of the appropriate indications for cardiac MRI. So thank you for your attention.